Good afternoon and welcome everyone to another edition of Crisis Conversations live from the Better Life Lab. We started these conversations at the beginning of this pandemic to try to understand how it was affecting how we work and live and care, uh, what we expect from each other and business and the government. And now that it continues on and on, we're looking at what are we learning? What is it, what's, what is it exposing in the cracks in our system? And how can, we, how can we emerge from this better and stronger? So today we're going to be talking about paid sick leave. The United States is one of the only countries in the world that does not guarantee all workers have paid sick leave. Uh, there was an emergency bill that Congress passed earlier, which was, which covers, uh, it requires more uh, uh, employers to offer paid sick leave. And yet there are a number of exem exemptions and it doesn't cover everyone. And so uh, the other day I was talking to Marilyn Washington. She is a home health aide in San Antonio, Texas, and her employer chose not to offer paid sick leave. And because of the exemptions, she's not covered. She's a health worker and the new emergency legislation leaves out health workers as well as the employees of large companies uh, who are the grocery store workers and the um, delivery workers and the restaurant workers and all the people that we've come to rely on as essential. So I asked Marilyn, how did that make her feel? This is what she said. It makes you, make you really feel funny. like you just, we're not worth it. That's not worth uh, it. You know, like, oh, oh, well, you know, it just makes you feel like, hey, we out there going to make sure someone else to take care of people that are sick, to make sure that they'll be able to, you know, to do, since they can't do for themselves, that we have to go out there and do it. But, oh, well, if we get sick, you know, it's like, oh, well, hmm. you know, that that's your job as a healthcare worker. You have to go out and take care of the people. Even if it means you're risking your own health and, and you know, potentially your own life. Yes, and that's mm. how that's how it makes you feel. I was like, I tell them, I said, they don't even give us masks. I said, they they don't even give me gloves. I don't even have gloves, you know. But I made sure myself had gloves. I went and brought me two boxes of gloves and the hand sanitizer. And the wow. guy that I worked for, he was saying they should have gave you gloves. They didn't get. I said no. I said, but I I brought me two boxes of gloves. So we're very, we're very lucky we have Marilyn with us today on this live call. She's in between uh, two different patients that she takes care of today on Friday. Marilyn, uh, let, me, let me turn it over to you. Um, talk a little bit about what, what, what is that like, the decisions that you have to make uh, in terms of whether you go to work or not if you get sick. Well, it's pretty hard to work, especially when you're sick and you don't want to be around your patients sick because they already have a problem and it makes it kind of hard and it just feel like, oh, well, they don't care about their, their health care work, workers. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll always on time, no matter what. And to give you an example, I fell in April of last year and was very, and hurt myself, but I couldn't take off. I had to continue on to work. Mm. I worked all the way up until my left eye started to go like blind, like something was wrong with it. Wow. And I called the doctor and that, when I did that, they had to do an emergency surgery on my eye because it was blood behind it. It was a thing busted in the back of my left eye. Wow. And I had went from April all the way up until April, May, I think it was about the 1st of June when I realized my eye was bothering me so bad. I had to go ahead and take off. Did they offer me any money? No. They didn't offer anything. Everything come out of my pocket that I had to pay for. My medicine was expensive for the first time. And the first two times I had to pay like $80. That was for one medicine. And then I had to pay 150 for the surgery. And then once they, I had the surgery, my eye, uh, stuff that I have to use for my eye is like $35 a 
for a little bottle of eye drops that I have to use for the rest of my life. And it yeah. just feel like they it doesn't matter to them. So when I called her and told them I'm going to have to have surgery, and she told me, okay, well, be sure to let us know when you release because mm-hmm. we don't want you to go back until they're, they send us a release paper. paper. And so that lets you know that they really don't care about the health care workers. So, so well, thank and you. I, well, thank you for sharing your story, Marilyn. You know, let me let me um, let me go over to to Jody and and talk with you. So, Jody Heyman, she's the director of the World um, Policy Analysis Center at UCLA. Um, Jody, you've just come out with a a, a, a really um, a groundbreaking new report looking at paid sick leave around the world. You know, what did you find and how, uh, you know, how does Maryland's experience, uh, you know, would she have that same experience in other countries? Thanks, Bridget. And thanks so much, Marilyn, for sharing that. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear how they're treating you and I think it makes such a difference you're sharing that experience with everybody because it really brings home what's so exceptional and not in a good way about the United States, which is nearly every other country around the world guarantees paid sick leave at a countrywide level. So we studied 192 countries, 181 of them, and these are all the top economies, but they're also low, middle, high income countries. They all provide paid sick leave. And I think it especially comes home when we hear this about our healthcare workers, our grocery store workers. This is affecting the daily lives of everyone and it's affecting the daily lives of people providing essential services. So we're not caring for everyone in our community in the United States this way and it affects the health of individuals. It also affects the spread. It's part of why the pandemic is so bad in the United States. Is that because, you know, as you're saying, workers are basically forced to choose. If I feel ill, you know, you want them to be able to stay home so that they don't spread the illness. And yet if they have to choose between not being able to pay rent or you know, not, not being able to afford to take that day off. It makes it a very impossible choice for a lot of people. Exactly, exactly. So right now in the United States, um, in the absence of paid sick leave for people who don't have it, we're making people make impossible choices where neither is a real choice. Go to work sick, make your own health worse, maybe spread it to other people, but you're almost expected to go to work sick because you're not, you're being told you won't be getting pay you need if you don't go to work sick or stay home, but then how do you cover basic costs and how do you pay for medicines, for healthcare, for uh, rent, for anything, and that is just not the case in the rest of the world. I'll just give, give one other um, relevant fact. We looked at all the other top economies because sometimes people say, oh, if the United States had this, we'd have more unemployment. It would cost business too much. But in fact, the most successful countries, they all provide paid sick leave to everyone. Hmm. So, Jolene, let me turn over to you. Again, I'm turning at my my screen to, <laughs> to where your little box is on my Zoom call. So, Jolene, uh, you are a community organizer with the Texas Organizing Project. You talk a lot to a number of different workers. What are you What are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are they experiencing? I mean, do some have paid sick leave and they can make a choice to stay home easier? Do others not have it? What are you seeing on the ground? Well. Um, <clears throat> we've talked with uh, call center workers here in San Antonio. We've also talked with waitresses. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, um, one of our um, leaders at Texas Organizing Project is Kevin. Um, he works at the AT&T Center. Um, he doesn't have paid sick leave. And, um, and so when the NBA shut down, um, our, you know, local um, 
uh, franchise, um, he was out of a job. Um, and so many people who work in that industry, um, you know, he was uh, working on that limited income. So he's uh, frequenting the food bank. Uh, we made sure to check in with him to make sure, you know, see that he had all of the needs uh, taken care of. Mm -hmm. But um, other folks like uh, who still are going to work, uh, call center workers were required to go to work. And um, they uh, found out in one of them, uh, like the Kohl's call center, that, uh, that there was a, an employee with uh, COVID-19. And that unit started to get additional employees with uh, coming down with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And um, the company, all the company did was said that they were cleaning, giving, you know, doing extra cleaning. And the employees themselves, they're not feeling taken care of. Mm -hmm. uh, without paid sick leave, um, many of these uh, workers, many of these working families are uh, forcing themselves to go to work, even though they may uh, not feel 100% well, because we can't afford to miss our rent check, you know, our rent mm -hmm. payment. Uh, we can't afford not to take care of our families. And if we do get sick, it's a, like a double whammy. You know, we have medical bills uh, and we are also forced to, you know, to take days off um, because we can't um, go to work. And so, um, and, and, you know, and our work is not covering um, our, um, our salary while we're out. So okay. it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult as a, um, you know, in a low wage town that San Antonio is, we're one of the poorest large cities uh, uh you know in this in this country and uh, we are i feel like on the front lines of this um of this pandemic with so many low-wage workers and so many um families who are uh impacted at the worst in the worst level you know black uh families and brown families latino families are often the ones we're the ones that are working these uh jobs in the um, hospitality industry, yeah, uh, in the healthcare industry as well. So, you know, Jolene, if I could stay with you, when I was talking with Marilyn, you know, Marilyn also lives in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is, like many, uh, well, not that many, um, you know, because we don't have a national policy, there are some cities that have passed their own paid sick leave right. laws, you know, and they'll say like restaurant workers uh, or restaurant owners are actually um, behind it in many cases. It's like, look, I don't want my workers coming to work and sneezing on other people and getting my customers sick, that that's just, mm -hmm. it's not good for my workers. It's not good for my customers. It's not good for my business. So right. that you have uh, local businesses who are behind it. Some states have passed paid sick leave laws. So I understand that that's happening in Texas, that there have been local, you know, Dallas and San Antonio that have passed paid sick leave laws, but what's happening with them? Why is Maryland still not covered? Well, uh, the industry um, lobby groups have um, put forth a, um, a lawsuit. So they don't have money to pay their employees, right? That's their claim. Um, but yet they have funds to spend on expensive lawsuits that then have stopped our paid sick leave laws in Texas. So although residents in San Antonio, hundreds, over 100,000 residents uh, pushed and signed a petition um, to get it passed in San Antonio, the industry lobby groups, including the restaurant uh, industry, the temp agencies, um, and uh, the manufacturers, they all came together and they uh, put forth a lawsuit that then the courts um, created an injunction Mm -hmm. an injunction on our, our current paid sick leave law. Mm -hmm. So um, right now we're without paid sick leave, many, many families, and it's uh, over 4 million families in Texas alone that are working hard without paid sick leave. Wow. So Marilyn, let's go back to you. I know that I, I think you said you were sitting in your car <laughs> waiting for your next uh, uh, patient to, you know, who needs you. Um, can you, you were talking a little bit yesterday when we were talking that, you know, you have these, these patients that you care an awful lot about, but that you're also the breadwinner for your extended family. So, yeah. now, you know, so now that we're in the middle of this pandemic, you know, you talked earlier about, you know, the previous fall that you took and how you kept going to work. But, you know, what's that like now with the pandemic raging when, you know, 
who knows who's infected and you know who knows what will happen i mean and you yourself you you're 71 years old so you're in that yeah. high risk category yourself yeah it makes me feel uh, i feel kind of a lot of word stress because i feel like i don't want to stop working because the patients that i work for they really they really uh need me and I would feel like I would be putting them down if I just stopped. And then I have my family to think about also, because I have both of my brother and my older sister, both of them are sick, and I, watch, I take care of both of them. Mm -hmm. I have to make sure that everything is well with them, so not to bring problems home to them. I don't say, I don't say very much, but this uh, epidemic has got me so stressed out because I worry about coming home, what if I got it and I give it to them? Mm. And plus, I have a one-year-old that we take care of. And I have to think about all of that when I come home. I have to think about it. I make sure my mask is on all day. I make sure that I clean my house, my hands, and everything is, is clean. Yeah. But it's still a lot of stress on you because okay. you got, I have, I have the people that I'm dedicated to to go see to them. And then I have my family that I'm dedicated to not to take no virus into the home because they're already sick. Yeah. Well, and it leaves a lot of stress on you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Marilyn. So, Jody, let's go back to you. Um, you know, uh, again, when you've looked around the world, um, you know, is there any kind of association that you have found with? Um, you know, countries that offer paid sick leave or comprehensive policies and spread of the disease? Or, or what do we know from other research about why these policies are important, you know, in this, in this time of, uh, in, in this public health crisis, but really kind of in any, like influenza or, you know, what do we know from the research? So, so we know a lot of things from the research about just regular years. The influenza, regular seasonal flu, it kills tens of thousands of Americans every year. It's not because more of us have had it and there's a vaccine. It's not the kind of threat that COVID is, but it still is a big threat and it still costs 11 billion a year. Wow, 11 billion dollars a year. Yeah, and in the U.S. alone, and in cities and states that have passed and implemented paid sick days, there's less influenza. Hmm. We also know just in a regular year that people get many foodborne illnesses, diarrhea, vomiting. Why? Because somebody's had to go to work as a food worker sick. Hmm. So few have paid sick leave that one in five report they had to go to work when they had diarrhea or vomiting. Oh, and that's yeah. usually infectious. That yeah. spreads to everything. So, so the part that's really difficult for me to fathom, I know what you say is true, Jolene. I, I know we see um, the lobbyists from restaurants and others opposing these bills. But it's so much in their economic interest as well. Uh, the businesses are just not sustainable. It's not only in our human interest, but it's completely unsustainable when we get people sick. Uh, just one last thing, then, then that comes to COVID. In fact, countries like the United States, like Italy, which while it had paid sick leave, it didn't have it from the first day. These are countries where there's a more explosive pandemic. Paid sick leave alone is not enough to stop the spread, but it's an essential component because people just can't stay home without it. Mm. Right. You know, so, so with this emergency legislation that Congress passed, you know, it did offer or it does offer starting April 1st, started offering 10 days of paid sick leave to people who worked for companies of less than 500 employees. So if you worked for a larger employee, you were out, uh, a larger employer, you weren't covered. 
Um, it also enables small employers to uh, petition to opt out, um, you know, if they can prove that it's an economic, uh, going to be a, a hardship for them. And it also exempted health workers like Maryland and first responders, you, they could also opt out. So Jody, one of the things I'm wondering is, um, you know, has anyone, uh, you know, do other companies kind of like slice and dice the, the workforce like this and say some can be covered and others can't? And I think the other thing to point out is that this, this legislation, it's emergency and it's temporary and it expires at the end of the year. So how does this, how does the U.S. compare to others in terms of, you know, kind of slicing and dicing the workforce? All 181 countries, these were permanent policies. So mm -hmm. none of these expire. And in all 181 countries, they cover every size firm, small, medium, and large. So sometimes they cover them differently. They might have some social insurance to help cover the parts of the cost for mm -hmm. smaller companies or to help cover some of the costs for long sick leave, yeah. because many of them have six weeks, six months and longer. But zero decided that if you were an employee, you wouldn't be covered because of your firm size. And so to that point, to, to firm size, um, it, you know, I, I'd love to bring in um, my colleague, Haley Swenson at this point. She's the deputy director of the Better Life Lab. And she and our uh, uh, Rosalind um, Miller, our policy analyst, have been doing an amazing job since the, uh, the pandemic started, really looking at the large companies, the large employers who were exempted from the paid sick leave law to see if they have voluntarily offered to, uh, to have paid sick leave to cover their employees, uh, how difficult it is for employees to actually access it, who's been silent. So I'd love to have Haley come in and talk about, you know, what are you finding in, in tracking some of these largest employees, uh, employers that, that have been exempted from paid sick leave? Hi, thanks for bringing me in, Bridget. I think this is such an important conversation. Um, what we've been noticing as we're tracking these companies that are exempted from the emergency sick days uh, legislation that passed in April, no, I'm sorry, late March, um, is that a lot of the companies that are employing mostly low wage workers, service workers, interacting with the public, of course, where contagion and spread are um, problems, not just for the workers, but for the customers who are relying on them. Uh, the, the companies that are voluntarily offering a policy, there's a real shortcoming to them, which is that most of them are requiring doctor's confirmation mm. uh, that it's a COVID-related absence. Um, and as we know, with testing so um, uh, slow and lackluster um, and insufficient and the fact that so many Americans don't have access to uh, regular medical care, I think there's a real concern that that's almost impossible for workers to get. And so if you need that kind of doctor's note before you can stay home, uh, that it's going to actually uh, prevent you from being able to use the policy even if it's written on the books. Um, you know, I think a lot of white white collar workers would be pretty insulted by their employers requiring a doctor's note before they could take a sick day. Like right. my sick day process is I, I slack Bridget and I say, you know, I don't feel well, I can't work today. And that's that. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any evidence in these other countries that have national policies that workers are abusing the policies. Do they need doctor's notes? I mean, it just seems like red tape that is to me, built on a, a sort of prejudiced idea that, that low-income workers would abuse this system with no evidence that that's the case. Yeah. You know, uh, let me go back to Jolene. It looked like you, you were wanting to jump into the conversation. Um, you, know, can, you know, can you talk, to, talk about that and then also about, about what's happening in, in Texas? You're one of the states where everybody's eager to open up now, right? That's right. And uh, on the point of... Um, you know, abuse of paid sick leave. Uh, we find that uh, that uh, uh, employees really are judicious about when they use their paid sick leave, and um, and they oftentimes don't use all of it, and some don't use any at all. They're saving it up for emergencies, and they're saving it up for times when they are sick or when they have to take care of their child. So um, if that's you know the abuse of paid sick leave is something that. Um, doesn't, the facts don't bear that, you know, that story out. It actually is that employees are, um, are very responsible with the way that they are using paid sick leave. And, um, 
uh, in Texas, unfortunately, the um, governor, Greg Abbott, was very eager to open up our state. And, um, and really, um, his, the people he, he really listens to are business owners who are putting um, the lives of working families on the front lines. So we're opening up restaurants and nail salons, and we're opening up um, all kinds of, uh, you know, industry across the state. And we do not have uh, the protection of paid sick leave mm. here in the state of Texas. Mm. And uh, what the result is, is we're continuing to see um, the infection rates, um, uh, you know, come, you know, rise. And we're also um, knowing that, um, uh, that things are not, we're not prepared as a state to handle the healthcare crisis that may result from this and that our families are hurting the most. We're, we are the ones who are least able to quarantine because we are forced to go out and in, into work and potentially bring this back. And we also face um, difficulties with childcare. If yeah. uh, our families are out there having to, um, to work and our schools are closed down as they are, then um, one of our, our members who's also a a care provider said she had to make a difficult decision uh, to leave the older, you know, 12 and 14 year olds in charge of the younger ones at home mm. yeah. because the schools were closed and she still had to go to work. Mm. And, um, and we're just faced with so many inhumane, dis, you know, choices here in Texas. In in particular, I just have to say, you know, Greg Abbott has not put uh, the black and brown community uh, at the forefront of these um, decisions when making um, the choice to open up our economy, because really our lives and our families are on the front lines without paid sick leave. And if we do not consider the majority of the state, then our state is still going to suffer economically. Uh, our health is going to suffer, and uh, you know our families right now are doing without food on the table. And mm -hmm. it's not going to get better to open up before we're ready and before we've taken care of each other's health. Right, and you know, and you make a really good point that you know, in some of the in, in the case of the worker who had to leave her children with her not not so uh you know old uh you know her, her children who were not who are not so old um you know workers who work for large employers were also exempted from uh, the emergency paid family leave law so that you would be able to take time away from work if you had if your children's schools were closed or their child care centers were closed well the same people who are exempted from paid sick leave who are a lot of the same communities that we've been talking about they're also exempted from paid family leave, so they do not have that either. So at this point, let me let me turn back to you, Marilyn. Um, you know, you're you're on the front lines of this every day. Um, you know, as you think about this, what is it that that you would that you would hope for? What would what is it that you hope that we learn from all of this, and how can we make this better for all workers, for all for our public health, uh, as well as for the economy? And and as Jody argues. Uh, that when you do this for workers, you're actually improving things for business. What do you hope that we do that we'll learn out of this? I was hoping and praying that they will learn that although we, they look at us as the lower working people, that I wish they would learn that things would come out, that they would do something to get together and think about the low working class people like me, we we look they look at us just as home health providers, but we just like the nurses at the hospital. We go in, they sick, we take care of them, we worry about them, we do what we can for them, and we try to make them as comfortable. And when we go in, we try not to show we don't show no kind of stress or upset to upset them. But I'm praying that we that the government look at it and give us paid sick leave. They have to understand that we're putting our life on the line just like anybody else, and they need to to let the home help home care people have paid sick leave. All right. Well, thank you so much for for that, Marilyn, and thank you to all of the the panelists today. 
Uh, Jody, thank you for, for being here and for the amazing research that you continue to do. Jolene, thank you so much for sharing the stories of so many workers in, in Texas and, and appreciate you bringing that perspective. Marilyn, it was delightful to speak with you again today. Thank you so much. Um, I'd also, thank yeah, I'm so glad you. you're here. And you know, I'd like to thank all of the participants. Thanks for being part of these conversations. We really appreciate your, your stories and perspectives. Um, and uh, next week we'll be talking more about home health. Um, this was a was supposed to be a, a, a response to nursing homes, you know, so that you wouldn't have what we what we're seeing now in the COVID crisis, just an inordinate number of, of infections and in this in this area. And we'll be talking. Actually, it'll be a hopeful story that the state of Washington is doing some very interesting things to make sure that that workers like Maryland are valued and that these are good and decent jobs. And so it's it's gonna be hopeful what we can learn from Washington. Maybe there'll, there'll be um, lessons that we can all adopt moving forward to make these um, decent, dignified jobs that we all rely on. As people say, I think Ai Jin Poo says it well, this is the work that enables all other work to be done. So thank you so much. I'd like to thank my, my wonderful Better Life Lab team, the New America events team who are so fantastic every week. Um, my producer, David Schulman, is fantastic. Um, thank you all so much for being part of these conversations. Uh, wash your hands, take good care, and we'll see you next week.